This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from opentuition.com. Now we're going to look at the potential effect that outsourcing a function can have on an audit. All sorts of activities nowadays are outsourced. It's become quite a popular way of managing a company. Uh, typically, uh, you outsource your delivery to a logistics uh, company rather than having your own lorries and vans. Uh, quite a lot of uh, companies outsource uh, substantial parts of their manufacturing rather than having their own uh, production facilities. For many of these functions, the uh, outsource company then just becomes like a supplier. Uh, and there is no uh, particular uh, audit implication uh, of that. In general, uh, they might decide to outsource for these reasons. It, it, financial efficiency, it might actually be cheaper to outsource. Uh, if you outsource to a, a, a very efficient provider who's going to be operating uh, very large production facilities, uh, they might be able to make uh, units for you and make a profit uh, at a lower cost than you can actually do yourself. Sometimes it's done uh, as a, a process, really, of uh, change management. So you're trying to push through a change in the organization, uh, but people are being very resistant. You don't think they're going to uh, encompass that change or deal with that change very well. Uh, one uh, option, a rather harsh option, is to maybe say, right, we'll close down that department. We think you are uh, beyond redemption. Uh, I will simply outsource that. And of course, it could be used as a threat. And then there is uh, strategy, strategic reasons, uh, that we simply think uh, that manufacturing is going to be done more efficiently in large-scale uh, production facilities, maybe based in an area with low labor costs or, or close to the natural resources, something of that. Uh, nature, and we will turn ourselves really into a kind of design and marketing uh, organization will stick to what we're good at and outsource the rather dreary stuff uh, that doesn't add value somewhere else. So here are the uh, advantages and disadvantages in general of outsourcing. Uh, it may give us cost advantages, not always, it, it, it depends. Uh, it will give us access maybe to specialist services. So if we have to uh, undergo, uh, you know, we design something where there's a particularly difficult bit of manufacturing involved, uh, then it might be better, safer, cheaper, higher quality to outsource that to a company with that expertise. Outsourcing is a way of transferring risk. Uh, so the, the risk, and indeed uh, within that the, the risk of a variable cost or cost overrun, uh, is pretty satisfactorily uh, transferred to the company which is providing the, the outsourced production or the outsourced services, whatever it's going to be. And uh, cash flow. Uh, so you don't have to uh, set up a, a large uh, production facility and raise capital. Uh, you uh, simply pay for what you buy, uh, really. Uh, and of course it, it reduces uh, um, the impact of fixed costs. You, you in general, are changing fixed costs to variable costs or potentially variable costs if you outsource production. Disadvantages? Well, you lose control. Uh, you can try and put on uh, very good service contracts and so on that they will uh, adhere to what you require, but you've lost control. And indeed, you've lost some data in, in, in a way. It, it is now located uh, somewhere else. So there may be confidentiality uh, aspects to worry about. The initial cost can be high, and by that I mean it's not as high as setting up a production uh, facility, but if you outsource a service, the service provider will normally have to do some investigation with you uh, to find out what you do and what you need. It can be quite irreversible. Uh, so, so if you outsource your IT, uh, it really means that, uh, or can mean, usually means, that your IT facilities, the hardware, becomes owned by the outsourcer and your IT employees become employees of the outsourced company. 
and the data is out there as well. So what happens if five years later uh, you think you're getting a bad service from your IT uh, uh, provider? Uh, it's it's quite awkward to bring it back because you don't own the hardware, you don't have the stuff, and you don't even have the data. Uh, and sometimes what happens is the outsource contract is entered into because it looks quite cheap. But then in uh, four years' time, when it's up for renewal, you see quite a big uh, hike in the price uh, because the outsource company knows that it's uh, uh, can be quite difficult for you to switch providers or to bring it back in house. It still has to be managed, uh, although it gets rid of uh, a lot of uh, uh, management having to, to, to worry about perhaps a non-value added activity, non-core activity. It does still have to be managed. You have to choose the outsourcer. You have to make sure that they're providing the uh, service that they signed up for. And finally, there's a liability for poor work. Your customers don't I'm not really interested that what you are selling there may have been made by a third party. Uh, there, as far as they are aware, are buying from you, receiving a service from you, and you are responsible for that. Uh, and if the outsourcer turns out to be of poor quality, then that is going to damage your own reputation. <clears throat> One of the things that can be outsourced is actually internal audit. So, so rather paradoxically, you can have kind of external suppliers of internal audit. Uh, but, but this is becoming relatively uh, common. Advantages, uh, no recruitment. If you want to set up an internal audit department, it can be kind of instantly done uh, by going to a, you know one of the large firms of accountants and saying, I want you to be our internal auditors. Uh, these people uh, are, are specialised in audit and they will be able to provide specialist services, specialist expertise, uh, which it might be difficult for you to provide if you were to set up your own little internal audit department of four people. They can spend the uh, the appropriate amount of time with you. Uh, I think I said earlier that having one internal auditor only uh, is not great. It's quite a lonely life, this internal auditor is having to stand up and criticize, you know, other people, maybe in the accounting department. So you want two, three, or maybe four internal auditors. You want a team, really, because they get kind of mutual support from that. But maybe you don't have enough work for a team. Mm -hmm. So uh, the appropriate amount of time, you, you can bring in a team of external internal auditors uh, for maybe a total of four months a year, and you have to pay them for the rest of the time. And flexibility uh, and short-term needs can be met. So if you discover a fraud, Quite often you want to, to really blitz that, find out how it's happening, how much have we lost, who's been involved. You want loads of people coming in, kind of crowding into the, the business, doing a, a detailed investigation uh, very quickly. Uh, and if it's externally sourced, then of course they, they can uh, have the flexibility to move people to your uh, operations and deal with, with that emergency. Disadvantages, uh, potentially cost. This is kind of up and down depending on the arrangement and how much you need people and so on. There are certainly complications or potential complications of external auditors are used. Uh, we have to be careful of the independence. We have to be particularly careful of self-review threats and familiarity threats and uh, uh, so on. So the external auditors uh, are going to be presumably reviewing the work done by the internal auditors uh, but then they're reviewing the work of kind of people from the same firm uh, and the review mightn't be as rigorous as it otherwise might be. And also reduced expertise. Uh, reduced expertise uh, because if you have internal internal auditors then they spend uh, you know every day really in, in the company they really get to know uh, all the details about the company, all its little peculiarities and so on. If you have these external internal auditors just coming in for four weeks, something of that sort, uh, then inevitably it's a bit like external auditors visiting. Uh, they won't have, uh, even though they spend longer than external auditors, they won't have maybe quite the same depth of knowledge uh, which a true internal auditor would have. 
How to sourcing of finance and accounting. Again, finance and accounting is, is not a core competence. It's a kind of necessary evil, this record keeping, this having to uh, collect money from your customers, pay uh, your suppliers and so on. Of itself, it is not uh, value adding. There's no secret in how it's done particularly. So it's safe to outsource. Advantages, uh, again, uh, you have uh, maybe expertise and specialists. Uh, they will be able to uh, keep you really up to date with modern IT and modern security uh, and the like. Uh, they will uh, maybe have expertise at integrating your internet uh, e-commerce, if you like, with the accounting records and, uh, and so on. Their core business is running accounting systems. And if that's how they make their money, they're going to get good at it. And it allows the outsourcer to concentrate on their core activities. You don't need to worry about all this accounting and uh, record keeping. They can concentrate on their design work and their marketing wherever they add value. Disadvantages, potentially cost. This can go either way. It, it, it depends on the deal. It depends on the efficiency of both uh, parties, if you like, in there. This distance from uh, data, uh, all your valuable data about sales and what different customers are buying and how different products uh, are, are, say, moving up and down and the popularity as, as the months go by and so on. This is held by the outsource company. <clears throat> and the outsource company is, is if you think about it, uh, concentrating on efficiency, whereas you might be uh, wanting to concentrate on what information can I get from that data? And there's a slight kind of discrepancy, if you like, uh, on uh, where both parties, if you like, uh, see where they can increase their profits. And it may be non-responsive to needs. Uh, by this I mean that the, the outsource company, the people running your finance and accounting, they would just like the same system to be there really year after year after year, so they don't have to update the software or uh, anything of that sort. Whereas you say, well, I'd now quite like this sort of report. I would like to, to see this uh, about my customers and so on. Can you change the software? Okay, uh, they, 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 they'll ask to be paid for it and so on. But, but it, it, it's, they, again, they might kind of rather say, well, uh, let's leave it a few months until I've got more time. Uh, they're not maybe going to be quite jumping to your request, although it is something which the service level agreement should, should help with. When it comes to auditing, however, uh, and you've outsourced your finance and accounting, think what's happened. The auditors need to audit the, the, what goes on in finance and accounting. Uh, they would typically like to go and see how the processing is done, how the authorizations are uh, carried out, uh, what sort of controls there are to make sure that the, the records are properly ke kept. Uh, and now they come to audit you and the records aren't there. The records are with a third party. Uh, and how are we going to uh, get on with the, the audit, if you like, uh, when maybe it's going to be awkward or maybe we're actually forbidden by the service provider to go into their premises and order what they're doing because they, you know, they're not being audited by us. So, so in, in some ways, the outsourcing and finance has gone into one like a black box, you know. Uh, it's a bit mysterious what's happening in there. Information goes in, information comes out, uh, and we're not absolutely sure what happens within this kind of mysterious black box that's, that's, that's there. Now, the difficulty uh, both clients have and auditors have depends on the, the services which is provided by the outsource company. It could just be recording transactions. Uh, so, if, if you take a, maybe somebody who just maintains receivables ledger, it's your client who approves the credit level for their customers. It's a client who receives orders. It's a client who approves the orders. It's a client who dispatches the goods. Uh, it's a client maybe who, who even raises the invoice. Uh, and all the service company does 
is to do the debits and the credits to the receivable ledger. Or actually, what they probably do is they produce the invoice and then do the debits and credits on the receivables ledger, essentially acting as a factor, because factors are form of outsourcing. But really, uh, they, they're taking uh, kind of no no real decisions uh, about what you're doing, uh, and it, it should be possible in that situation, really, for the client to satisfy themselves and therefore the auditor should be able to satisfy themselves uh, that the processing is happening correctly because you see what's going in. You've authorized these transactions. You see the uh, almost the invoices going in, uh, and then you see you know the payments appearing. Uh, no doubt they will send you or give you access to the uh, receivables ledger and so on. They're just acting as a um, almost, almost like writing it down, so to speak. However, in some situations, uh, we, we don't have that luxury of, of trying to almost order around the black box. We, we you know, we're satisfied that the workings are okay. Uh, but if uh, we're actually outsourcing as well, uh, uh, the power for this third party to take decisions uh, for executing part of your uh, business transactions. Uh, and taking really responsibility for the transactions. So now it's rather more as though uh, a customer order, instead of coming to your client, the customer order goes to the outsourcer. And the outsourcer is deciding whether or not to dispatch the goods or how to set the credit limit, uh, 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 looking after the uh, actual dispatch of the goods and, 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 and so on. So they're doing much more in a way, you don't know about the orders at all. You don't know about the sales at all, uh, other than through what the service provider has told you. And in that situation, it's it's harder for both the client and the auditor uh, to understand what's happening at the outsource company uh, and in a way how reliable that is uh, and whether or not it's going to be possible to get sufficient appropriate audit evidence that the, the kind of results as being reported to us from the service provider uh, are free of material misstatement. The sorts of way you can get uh, an understanding, uh, you can look at uh, the user manuals uh, provided by the outsourcer, you can look at the uh, technical manuals which they might provide, they may give you system overviews, this may show you basically the internal control system uh, so that you see, you can understand yourself, maybe that it, uh, provided it's operating, uh, that yes, they do do credit limit checks. And yes, they do have a credit control department which phones people up as they're being slow on payment. Yes, they do reconcile statements they get from suppliers and so on. You can see a, a proper internal control system has been kind of relocated from the client to the outsourcer. Although you haven't tested it yet. Uh, there may be reports uh, by the service organization on the operation of its internal control systems, uh, and you may be able to uh, see reports from the internal audit function of the service provider. And again, this is going to give you some uh, uh, confidence uh, that things are going okay. The outsourcer has their own internal auditors who uh, really check that their internal control system is working properly. You see a copy of that report it's going to give you some some confidence. Uh, prior knowledge about the service provider, uh, you've dealt with them before as an auditor and you know that uh, they've always been reliable with all these other 20 companies that they're uh, acting for, uh, a good reliable company, uh, the, the, the quality seems to be fine there. Inevitably that's going to give you some confidence that will be missing if it never come across these people before and had no idea what sort of quality of outfit they ran. You can compare input and output, and we've talked about that. Uh, it depends on what the input and output is, how uh, um, confident you're going to be, but you'll have some idea in very often what goes into the service company uh, and see what's come out of it uh, and see if it seems to be consistent. There are no discrepancies in that. With permission, you uh, may actually go and visit the service organization 
and with permission, uh, you may also be able to do some of your audit work there. Uh, be able to uh, look at how orders are authorised and so on. Uh, look to see how they have got segregation of duties within that uh, uh, service organisation. All the normal sort of internal controls and control functions and procedures and so on. Uh, you might be allowed to go and do an audit or part of the audit at the service provider. You can ask them for information. You can you know, give written requests. How's this done? Why has this happened? Could you explain that? And so on. This will all be facilitated somewhat if the service level agreement that your client enters into has got a, a clause in it saying, you, you know, you have to cooperate with our auditors. And then you can ask for what's called either a Type 1 or a Type 2 uh, report. So a Type 1 report, uh, yeah, they nearly look the same. Uh, these are reports coming from the outsource company. So a Type 1 report coming from the outsource company, it's a description, two parts of it, it's a description prepared by the management of the service uh, company. Uh, about the control objectives and about the controls which it implements. So it's like them almost describing their internal control system. And then part B of that report is a report provided by the service company's auditor that they have got reasonable assurance about the suitability of the service company systems. So the service company has set up its internal control system, if you like, and the service company auditor says that they think that the internal control system uh, uh, seems to be properly designed. The Type 2 report goes a bit further uh, than this. The Type 2 reports a description prepared by management, for control objectives and controls, that's the same as before, but it will also report on the operating effectiveness of the system. So it goes additionally, it says, here's a control system and it's working. And similarly, the uh, service uh, company's auditor uh, will also uh, certainly, or also you know, acclaim, uh, its, uh, or acclaim its effectiveness. Uh, and they'll say, here the tests were done and here are the results of these tests. This gives evidence that the controls present at the service company are operating effectively. Now, if you as auditor, through these various ways of gaining understanding uh, and maybe getting a Type 1 or Type 2 reports, if at the end of this process you are still not convinced that you have a sufficient appropriate audit evidence that your client's records uh, are being processed properly and therefore you are not uh, got the, the, the confidence to be able to say with reasonable assurance that the financial statements of your client are free of material misstatement, uh, then of course you're going to have to uh, modify your ordered opinion really to the effect that you don't know. You have insufficient information really about what's going on in this third party it still remained a bit of a, an obscure black box. We don't know what's going on in there uh, and we'd have to modify our ordered opinion.